Welcome to Chapter 5 on the International Cultural Environment. So in this chapter, we'll be looking at the meaning of culture, uh, what the cultural environment uh, implications that it has for business, uh, and we'll look what is meant by culture and society and what the characteristic elements and levels of culture are uh, with specific practical examples. So the specific outcomes that we will be dealing with in this chapter, uh, after you've work through this chapter, you should be able to discuss culture and work values, set out the different cultural dimensions, explain what is meant by cross-cultural literacy, expound upon cultural and business ethics, and discuss culture and competitive advantage. So, um, culture is our values and norms. It is what defines us, um, it is what identifies us and makes us different from others, um, but it is also often a point of meeting. So cultural diversity is important in business. If you think of South Africa, we have uh, nine provinces, 11 official languages, uh, we have different racial groups, uh, we have different religious groups, we have different uh, gender it's culture of its own, we have multiple cultures, but on a global scale, different countries have very many different cultures that we need to keep into account. And there's always a potential for cultural conflict, because culture comprises what we believe is right, and also the way in which we do things. So cultural awareness is important in global business, understanding culture and how it impacts upon business. And while culture is also a point of difference, it what defines us, it's part of our identity, it's what makes us unique. Um, if you think of South African and what defines South African, uh, the Springboks, uh, Shosha Loza, Nikosi Sikalele Africa, uh, different foods that we eat, burrowos, uh, pop, whatever. We've got all of these things that define our cultural uniqueness. So when we believe that our own culture is right and other cultures are wrong, it is known as ethnocentrism. So we believe that our culture is everything and everyone else is wrong at the end of the day. Okay. By understanding culture, we are able to predict, predict, plan, organize, manage, and evaluate different values and norms and understand how better to operate in other countries. So, in terms of a multinational corporation that you covered in Chapter 1, i.e. a corporation that operates in numerous countries across the globe, the need for cultural awareness increases where the company has numerous international offices um, and operations, operates in multiple countries, and increasingly handles international business because um, not everyone does business in the same way, not everyone understands business in the same way, not everyone works in the world in the same way. So it is incredibly important that we develop cultural awareness as our business becomes more global. Okay, sorry. Um, the role of culture in international business. Okay. In understanding culture, we better understand individual and group behavior. People behave 
differently. Uh, we eat different foods. We have different customs. Uh, we wear different clothes. Um, we have different things that we value or are important to us. Um, in one country, a cow is um, the next source of your next steak. In another country, the cow is revered as something holy and something that cannot be killed and it, it is a great wrong to do something bad to a cow. So, uh, you need to understand differences in culture and how we, um, or how different people, different people's cultures work at the end of the day. This is known as cross-cultural literacy, um, understanding different people's cultures, cultures. So understanding what their values are, what is important in particular cultures and norms, the way in which they do things, and their beliefs and habits. Um, so what may be normal in one nation may be very different in another. South Africa, for example, our work week is pretty much eight to five, five days a week. Uh, we are used to lunch breaks. Uh, we're used to things like sick leave and holiday leave, etc. If you had to be working in China, the norm there is up to 12 hours work a day, six days a week. Uh, you don't necessarily get all the privileges of leave and, or extended leave and things like that, it's a very different approach to work. And that is a different cultural view of what work comprises. So it's important to understand different nations' approaches to work, etc. So an international manager must understand work effectively uh, and work effectively with those from other cultures. Otherwise, they are going to knock heads at the end of the day. And you need to recognize the importance of cultural influences. Different cultures place different emphasis on things. Um, for example, let's say in Uganda, the, the church plays a very important role. Uh, people are quite conservative. Uh, they are fairly hardworking, etc., it may differ from another country, say, which is much more liberal and, uh, could we say, open-minded. Uh, so we may have a cultural clash if we come from a more liberal country and we want to come run a business in Uganda. Okay. So... So if we look at a definition of culture, culture is an integrated system of values and norms that are shared amongst a group of people and when taken together constitute a design for living. What does that mean? Okay, so what are the key words over there? So firstly, values, what is important to us? What are the things that define us that are key to who we are? what we will simply do and what often what revolves re us in other people. So what turns us off in other people is determined by our values. Um, let's say uh, an example that seems to come up quite often these days um, is the eating of dogs. So in South African society, a dog or a cat is a pet. Um, they are generally well looked after and form parts of households or act as guard dogs, etc. But in some countries in the East, uh, dogs and cats are simply viewed as um, another source of meat. It's a different cultural value of what is acceptable and not acceptable. So our values then influence our attitudes. So it influences how we react to particular things. The hand that you use to eat with, um, what is right, our beliefs about what is right and wrong, uh, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So all of these then translate into norms, which are the rules by which we live in society. Uh, 
So we have different cultural norms, uh, which, for example, you may have a norm about the type of clothes that you wear, uh, what men wear, what women wear, uh, what the role of children are in society, etc. So our norms are pretty much the rules that govern society. And then a culture is exhibited through its external symbols. Those are the things that we can identify cultures by. So it may be things like the type of clothes that are worn, hairstyles, uh, particular symbols that uh, cultures carry around with them, etc. But then also by things such as traditions, so what is celebrated within a society and rituals and also the stories that are with told within a particular society. Okay. Now, some societies are what is known as homogeneous. Homogeneous or homogeneous societies are societies in which there is little Conf, uh, cultural diversity. So, um, if you look at the next slide, Japan is a country that is very homogenous. Other cultures find it quite difficult to adapt to Japanese culture. Um, I will post a little video um, on Blackboard of an example where uh, people are talking Japanese who are not Japanese and the woman replies to them in Japanese or replies to the people who are not Japanese in English and the Japanese person who does not speak Japanese, she talks Japanese too. I.e. Japanese people tend to have a very similar culture and people from other cultures struggle to fit in with their culture. Heterogeneous culture on the other hand, uh, is a society with multiple cultures, i.e. Um, South Africa. We have a number of cultural groups in so South African society. As I said, we've got 11 different langu official languages. We've got multiple religions. Uh, we've got different racial groups. Uh, we have got uh, different... Um, tribal groups, etc. That creates a heterogeneous culture. In other words, we've got many cultures within a single nation. Okay, so it's important to note that a nation or a nation state is a political creation. It is the borders of a country created by politicians create a nation. Well, your culture cannot be created by a nation state. We often find that people living on the borders of two countries uh, may be similar to the people who live on the opposite side of the border. Uh, for example, the Swiss and the French um, share a common border and the people who live on the border, um, you get a lot of people who speak French on the Swiss side of the border and vice versa. Um, Pakistan and India, uh, they were colonial creations uh, when the, uh, Britain gave up their colonies. They created these two nations. It was an arbitrary creation where um, they summarily put a line between the two and uh, India is Hindu or predominantly Hindu and Pakistan was predominantly Muslim. But the reality is you get lots of people who identify themselves as Muslim within India and you get Hindu people within Pakistan and they have different cultural practices that align with their religious practices too. So the point is that culture goes across national borders. National borders are political creations. They are not uh, cultural creations in most instances.
Okay, let's see. They, okay. So on the slide, you've got an example of Japan, which I've already said, which is homogenous. They've got little immigration, uh, very similar culture. Uh, foreigners struggle to fit in there, not because they're unwelcome, but simply because they do not understand the culture of the country. On the other side, you've got the United States, which has had heavy immigration, has got many subcultures, uh, different religions, class, geographic locations, etc. And that's what is known as heterogeneous culture. So in other words, a multicultural society. Okay, so um, what, what are the characteristics of culture? This is important to understand. There are I've got over here seven different characteristics of culture. The first one, culture is learned by the members. If you think of your own culture, where did you learn it from? Your family, your community, your school, etc. So it is something that has been I don't want to say driven into you, but it's something that's been incorporated into you from a very young age. So it is difficult to change culture. It's not just simply going to change overnight. It's part of who we are. It's part of how we identify ourselves. Secondly, culture is shared between members. We teach other members of society what is appropriate cultural behavior and what is not appropriate cultural behavior. We criticize those who don't stick to cultural norms and we praise those who stick to cultural norms. Just think of the things that you make fun of. It's often persons who are not sticking to the norms. Or we make, um, we compliment people who do stick to the way in which we do things. Thirdly, culture is relative. What does that mean? Morals, beliefs and values are relative to a particular culture. Different rules, different cultures. So what is completely acceptable in one culture is completely unacceptable in another culture. So for instance, um, eating with your right hand is both in, if I'm speaking under correction, an Islamic culture and in Hindu culture um, is important, guys, because your left hand is done, used for other purposes, and it is frowned upon. In fact, it is taboo to eat with your other hand. Um, so it, it is relative what is right or wrong in a particular society. So, um, a second example, uh, let's say you are um, unfaithful to your partner. In many Western societies, it's going to be frowned upon, um, you'll be in lots of trouble with your partner, etc., but that's about it. But in um, more uh, let's say, uh, societies in which Sharia law is uh, practiced, you may be stoned um, or caned for being unfaithful to a partner. So it can have a much more serious consequence. Um, in the fourth place, culture is interrelated. So often at the center of culture is religion, but also then our business practices are related to this, our language, um, our education. So all of these things fit together. Culture is not a um, isolated thing. It is an interrelated thing and different aspects of our culture tend to impact on or tend to permeate across the, our culture culture and the way in which we do things. In the, let's see, uh, fifth place, culture is adaptive. What do I mean by that? Culture changes over time. Um, my 
um, let's just think, our eating habits, our clothes that we wear, um, our language that we speak adapts over time as society changes, etc. So what was acceptable or not acceptable 50 years ago today may be completely acceptable. Um, let's say, um, um, just trying to think of it, my Muslim colleagues, um, many are, do not wear strict Muslim uh, attire in the um, in class etc because and it is completely acceptable that is an example of culture that is adapt adapted over time and adapted to a multicultural environment in which there are many in influences uh, okay <laughs> uh, culture six place number six uh, culture is symbolic so, as I already said earlier, it has symbols, there are things that we can identify people um, in terms of physical attributes or physical um, characteristics that identify particular cultures, uh, from clothing to uh, the way in which we speak, to our architecture, to our taste in art, there are multiple symbols that um, identify culture. And then finally, culture is pervasive. In other words, culture is throughout a particular society. It is not something that just occurs in isolation or within a small group of people, etc. It happens throughout broader society. So, what are the six elements of culture, guys? It's important here that you make a distinction between the characteristics of culture that we've just looked at and the elements of culture or the parts of culture. So, over here, there are six elements of culture. So I'm going to go through each one of these on the next six slides. Okay. The first element is political philosophy. This comprises the values, norms, beliefs of a society. We already spoke about political systems in an earlier chapter, and the political system is the belief on how resources should be distributed and allocated within a particular society. So the political philosophy of a society influences the way in which a society is governed. So it has key implications whether you want to do business within a particular country as it influences the type of political system that will be present in that com country, i.e. capitalism, mixed market or communist um, political system. Okay. Very similar to the political philosophy is the economic philosophy, i.e. the way in which we see our, the, our resources should be allocated um, is influenced by the way in which we believe business should be done within a particular country. So the economic philosophy. In fact, you'll see on the slide that I've got capitalism, socialism, and communism in the bottom right-hand corner. So my economic philosophy decides on how money, in other words, the taxpayer's money, should be shared out in the society. Um, 
who owns what in society, etc. So our economic and political philosophy, in fact, are very difficult to separate from one another. The third element is social structure. Here, the question is asked, how is status and mobility achieved within a particular society? So, here the role of families, groups, etc. Um, is important. So, in some societies, social structure is what is known as ascribed. So, you achieve a social structure or you achieve your place within social structure based on your birth right within the society, i.e. who your parents are or who your grandparents are, etc. And that gives you your place in society and very little can be done to change society at the end of the day. Um, on other societies where social structure is is what is known as achieved and is often based on education on um, monetary financial uh, values etc uh, basically your social status is achieved through your education, through your business status, etc. If you think of South African society, we have got both of them active, but probably um, our social status is more achieved than it is ascribed at the end of the day. So, guys, it's important to understand the different strata of society. So, how are classes defined within a society? If we think of South African society, how is class determined? Where we live, what type of car we drive, uh, what, where we, uh, our level of education, how much money we have, who we related to, these are all questions that we would look at within a society to, to determine how social status is achieved within society. So whether it is possible to be mobile within that society. Um, if you look at the bottom left hand corner of the slide, there's an example of ancient Egypt uh, where basically you were born into a particular social strata within society and you could, ba you could almost, it was, sorry, let's just say it was almost impossible to move between the different levels. So uh, possibly you could be freed as a slave and become a farmer. But um, you could not, for example, move from be a scribe and become a government official or become royal family. In fact, royal family was only born into, there was absolutely no movement between these different levels. And societies in, modern, in the modern world still uh, differ or some differ in this regard. For example, India to not so long ago you had something called the caste system where you were born into a particular social caste and basically it was undesirable for someone else to marry someone or be in a relationship or even associate with persons who come from a lower social Okay, the fourth element is religious, religion and ethical systems. Uh, religion has a huge impact on the culture of societies. Uh, the religious beliefs of the predominant group within the society often influence the broader societal practices and the laws and norms within the um, society. So religion will often determine uh, what roles can be performed by people, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, uh, difference in roles between men and women, uh, the people's attitudes to work, um, 
but also things like dietary habits and the type of things that we consume. Uh, for example, earlier I referred to India and Hindus uh, who do not consume, um, in fact, they don't consume living animals. They are essentially vegetarians. Um, so that because of their religion, the, the type of food that is consumed within the society is influenced by their religious practices. But it also becomes the basis for political and economic decisions and things like major holidays. Um, the main religions in the world currently, uh, and it, this is not an exhaustive list, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. Now I can already hear some of you say, what Confucianism? Okay, so if you look at the next slide, there's a short little summary. Okay, so over on the slide you can read through for yourself, but the religion and origin and the economic and business implications of the religion. So, uh, if you look over there, Christianity, origin is Judaism, modern global religion, Protestantism, Catholicism, etc., etc. Uh, something called the Protestant work ethic arose from uh, Christianity, which comes down to the idea that uh, the Protestants in the last or in the late 19th century asked themselves a question, how do you know that you are saved? Because there's no earthly indicators. And they came to the conclusion that if you are blessed by God, i.e. if you are given many possessions and successful in business, etc., um, therefore you are chosen. And the, body, the idea essentially there was that the Protestant work ethic, that you work hard to be successful, God will bless you, and therefore you should go to heaven one day. That's a direct example of how religion has influenced work practices. Uh, if you look at uh, Islam, uh, second largest global religion, supports capitalism, but emphasis is on societal obligations. But it's also got implications such as um, you're not allowed to earn interests and different business practices, etc. I'm not going to go through all the lists. Uh, Confucianism, which you may think is a um, unknown or whatever religion is actually that was the official religion of China until 1949 and the underlying belief of Confucianism is that you achieve salvation through good deeds or correct actions so similar to Protestantism at the end of the day so it values things like loyalty, reciprocal obligations, honesty, and uh, works with things like um, organizational trust and collaboration is encouraged by Confucianism. The point is you need to understand how religion within a particular country is likely to influence the way in which you conduct business within that country. Okay. The fifth element is communication and language. Uh, all cultures have their own unique language, and it is not necessarily a language like English, Afrikaans, Corsa, but it's also about the way in which we use words and which we understand things within our culture. So, uh, if you, there's a quite a well-known study where they looked at um, how people from the East associate words compared to how people from the West associate words. So people in the West, if you say give them um, an example where you say a cow, a uh, a cheetah, and a, a rabbit, and 
um, let's say grass, uh, probably a bad example now, um, I'm now I'm getting stuck with <laughs> Uh, grass, uh, meat, and uh, seed. So Westerners are more likely to put the animals together and the foodstuffs together, whereas the um, people from the East are more likely to work on the relationship so that a cow would eat um, grass, the rabbit seeds, and the cheetah meat, etc. I probably haven't explained it as well as I could. But the point is, language is much more important than simply different words that mean the same things. We create meaning through language. So, uh, language influences both our written and verbal communication, but also understanding non-verbal communication within a society. Okay, so, as we've already said, language is a medium of communication, how we communicate with one another within the society. Um, it influences the way in which we think. As I said, it filters our perceptions. Uh, just think of whether you refer to your your Part, the person that you're in a relationship with as your partner, your love, um, your uh, wife or husband, your sweetie, whatever, or um, you use some gangster terminology. Um, it implies very different relationships or very different meaning to that relationship at the end of the day. So, Language creates meanings and filters our perceptions of how we see things at the end of the day. Uh, so, and language is how we communicate uh, cultural values of society and also how we can misunderstand one another. So, understanding language in a particular society is a source of competitive advantage. It's a critical source of competitive advantage. And it's often... A key aspect that multinational corporations employ local persons in order to gain an understanding of the language and the usage thereof. Uh, but of course there's also the colonial legacy uh, of English and French and Portuguese that still persists with many countries still using those languages. So um, being able to translate language and Culture is incredibly important within the global business environment. Okay. Now, the sixth element that we've got over here is education. Um, education plays a key role within culture. So, the higher the level of a society's education um, generally indicates the gross or relates directly to the gross domestic product of the country. More educated societies tend to be richer so societies at the end of the day. But also, one of the key things One of the key things, um, if you look over here, I've got global literacy rates. So, if you look, North America, Europe, Asia, very high literacy rates, Russia, uh, China, etc. Um, or Russia to a large extent, China not so much, but Asia and Africa have low literacy rates. South Africa has a fairly high literacy rate. It's important, guys, for um, not just the skills within a particular culture, but also it implies to a large extent how people approach life and uh, it's more easy to conduct business often in societies with higher rates of literacy at the end of the day. Okay, now, guys, we need to look at, ah, sorry, we need to look at the levels of cultures, guys. So, um, up to this point, 
we have looked at the elements of culture and we've looked at the different dimensions included in culture, guys. But the levels of culture imply that culture occurs in society on more than one level. So if you look at the first slide over here, we have a national culture, i.e. you have, I'm going to go through now in terms of details, but we are South African, we are German, we are Ugandan, we are whatever, we got our national. But then our national culture impacts on our business culture. But within the business culture, you have each organization which has its own unique culture. And within your organizations, you also have occupations, which in turn have their own cultures. So multinational management implies that we need to be able to understand uh, how these different levels of culture operate within different societies. So, the first level of culture is national culture. So, it's a dominant culture within the borders of a particular country. Uh, it represents the majority of the population or the population group with the most influence. That's an interesting point because you may have a dominant culture that is driven by a minority within a country where uh, you have a non-democratic political system within that country. Uh, this is often the case within Middle Eastern countries and leads to a lot of conflict at the end of the day. Uh, as we've already said, political boundaries do not equal cultural boundaries, i.e. you cannot enforce a culture upon people. However, um, it has key implications for global business. So the dominant culture, education, religion, beliefs, etc. are how culture generally operates within that country. For example, um, German culture is uh, very much precision, on time, does not tolerate or focuses on excellence and factors like that. And that is the way it works in Germany. Um, trains are on time, um, things work properly, etc. And that's because their culture expects it to work that way. Secondly, secondly, we have business culture, the second level of culture. So what does that mean? It's a way in which business is done in a particular country. So what is valued, but very importantly, norms and attitudes towards business, how we interact, what etiquette is, what is acceptable, what is unacceptable. Um, when Chinese people do business or Japanese people do business, they often sit down, you talk, you first get to know each other before you even think of talking about business. Whereas in uh, Western culture, it's often about sitting down, we first do business, and then we talk and get to know each other afterwards. So it influences all facets of work, um, and it's important to understand business culture within a particular society. Okay. You've got an exercise on business culture. There's a video, five tips on business culture in Dubai. Ah, oh, sorry. There's a video, five tips on business culture in Dubai. Uh, I want you to identify the five issues while you sit and watch the video, i.e. sit and take notes. And what are the five issues that you need to consider when you do business in Dubai? Again, I must emphasize, don't just read the summary, actually is 
it's a, sorry, there's the details of the video. It's on Blackboard. Um, alternatively, there's a URL, and you can search for it on YouTube using the information over there. So, watch the video. Um, before you go to the feedback, try answer it for yourself, guys. Um, the reality is you only learn if you do things for yourself. And again, these are the sort of questions that you will encounter in the test at the end of the day. So... Are you looking for the... Okay, so what's interesting, the young lady in the video, um, if I have to judge her accent, I would say she's Russian or from somewhere in the East Bloc, um, but she speaks about Dubai, and this is quite important, guys, because it also gives you an indication of other aspects of their culture. So she said, mentions that Dubai is a multicultural society. So about 80% of Dubai society comprises of expats. Uh, however, so, okay, perhaps we should first cover what are expats. Expats are people from other countries. So 80% of their professional people come from other countries and 100% of their manual laborers. Uh, but one of the ironies of life is that um, you generally refer to as a foreign worker if you are lowly skilled while you're an expert, expat. Um, if you have um, skills and are in a white collar position at the end of the day. So guys, um, she mentions that the local culture and traditions are important. They must be acknowledged within so the, the society. Okay, so what are the five things that she draws out in the video? The first thing is that um, that it is predominantly Arabic culture. Uh, although Arabic is spoken, English is the most common language. Uh, although it is an advantage to be able to speak Arabic, but that official forms are generally in Arabic and English. Uh, but the majority of communication within Dubai takes place in English. Um, so you're okay if you speak English in Dubai, but it doesn't hurt to be able to understand Arabic, etc. Okay. Secondly, she speaks about meetings. Okay. Their work days. Okay, so is this an implication, guys? And it also relates to religion. Their work week is from Sunday to Tuesday. And their business culture, they work from 9 in the morning to 6 in the evening. But their public servants work from 8 in the morning to 2.30. So there's a difference between the public service and the uh, business culture. But she mentions that the... Business culture in Dubai is founded upon relationships. So business happens in informal places, restaurants, etc. And if you want to be able to get ahead in Dubai, it's all about making personal contacts and uh, getting people to trust you. But also she points out if you set a meeting, you should put in extra time because often that... Uh, the business only happens at the end of a meeting and the meeting often runs over schedule. So she then mentions there that patience is a very important aspect of um, culture within Dubai, i.e. you have to be patient, you have to be tolerant. So it's not the push, push, push culture that you're perhaps used to in Western culture or even uh, it, yeah, okay. She also mentions the uh, uh, greeting, the 
Salam alaikum, greeting, um, and you don't shake hands with the opposite gender. So do you see all of these things, guys? Religion influences it. Um, the practices, what we do, what we don't do. Uh, so it, religious roles are determined over here, or religious or gender roles are also. Um, thirdly, clothing. Um, if you are Arabic, the Arabic people wear the... The men work, excuse my pronunciation if it is terrible, but the men, the conjurer, and women cover their head. But bottom line is you should draw dress conservatively. Suit, formal work attire, etc. is the general, generally accepted as the proper way to dress yourself. Fourthly, she relates to the meetings one. She said all about business networks. Uh, business happens by word of mouth. So, if you do a good job, um, you make good relationships, you're likely to do well within, uh, cult within society in Dubai. And it's uh, get about getting to know people and networking. And then finally, uh, it means about Ramadan and business etiquette. Um, so... Muslim people do not eat between sunrise and sunset and it's impolite to eat in front of them or drink in front of them during this time. Uh, the day is two hours shorter and very important, she says, if you're invited for iftar, you must accept the invite because it will be taken as an insult if you do not accept it. So it's not okay just to say I'm tired or I'm on a diet or whatever. And you should greet, greet people with the term Ramadan Kareem during this time. So it is important, guys, that you understand or grasp these different elements of business culture. And this actually illustrates it quite effectively. Okay. Now, the third level is organizational culture. Each organization has its own culture. That's the way in which it does something. So, if I work for the bank or I work for a university, I'm likely to dress quite differently. I may have different working hours. I may have different working rules. The way in which we do things are different, etc. So, my organizational culture is influenced by the national and the business culture, but it's also created by the management of the organization and the creators of the organization, etc. So, it's important to understand your organization's culture. And then, guys, occupations also have different cultures. Uh, so, um, my white-collar workers, my office workers, often conduct themselves quite differently to my blue-collar workers. So, the... Um, manual laborers, etc., different cultures, different ways in which we inter or deal with each other, which we uh, speak to each other, which we um, interact with each other, etc. So, uh, it's important also to understand that different occupations have different ways of doing things. My accountants are all focused on numbers and profits and expenses, etc. And hopefully my HR people, that is you, uh, are focused on the people and the importance of looking after people in the organization and not necessarily about the profits and numbers at the end of the day. Guys, there's a short little video here that emphasizes about what is organizational culture and how norms and values play a key role within organizational culture. Um, if you go on to Blackboard, regardless of whether. So, sorry that I haven't. Uh, sorry that I haven't included the videos in the slideshow, but it chews up all the 
uh, bandwidth and creates havoc when I try to record them. So same story guys, the detail of the video, go download it, watch it guys. I didn't put it there for my health. Um, it will give you a good insight into understanding organizational culture and very likely express it more effectively than I have at the end of the day. Okay. Now, what are the implications of culture for international businesses? There are four key issues of, of connection that we're going to be looking at over here. So why is culture so very important for international businesses and for any businesses as a matter of fact? So firstly, culture provides us with a competitive advantage. So if our cultural values are based on high performance and about achieving the best from the organization and reducing risks, etc., um, they are likely to create a more successful organization at the end of the day. So culture is key to organizational success and a competitive advantage. I've got Apple's logo in the corner over there. Part of Apple's success is the high value that they place on creativity and on innovation and on being the best um, and on being the leaders in their field and that is who they are that is how they define themselves and that has helped them to become one of the most valuable brands in the world today secondly guys Culture influences business ethics. Your organizational culture determines the values, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable within your organization. Now, if your organization is highly ethical, it is less likely to run into problems in the long run and it is more likely to exist in the organization stay in existence for longer. So culture defines our ethical principles. Uh, there's the Declaration of Human Rights that the UN has gone, but key aspects that are mentioned, so organizational cultures that respect human rights, respect local traditions, and believe that uh, context is important when deciding right and wrong, i.e. that you don't write run roughshod over uh, local cultures and local practices and beliefs etc. So culture and business ethics run very closely together. Okay. Cross-cultural literacy um, is very important in being successful in business, uh, yeah, guys, you've got three alternatives. Okay, so when you go to another country, you can use what is known as an ethnocentric approach. So, ethnocentric approach means you use your home country's methods, they're the best, that's the way that we do things. McDonald's makes use of an ethnocentric approach. They go to any country in the world and they sell American fast food and a McDonald's looks exactly the same anywhere across the world. The second one is a geocentric approach. A geocentric approach is an approach where you use the best methods no matter what the source is. Here you can think of um, Nando's. Nando's is a South African chicken restaurant that 
sells Portuguese chicken. So it was started in South Africa by a couple of Portuguese guys, but it has now moved across the globe. Um, and in the majority of countries that it operates in, people would have no idea that this is in fact a South African company because Portuguese chicken and cuisine is popular and that is what they have run with at the end of the day. Then the third approach is a polycentric approach where the business adopts the host country's methods for doing business. So if you had to be in the food industry, you would open restaurants that provide local cuisine, i.e. you would not come in with your own cuisine, etc. You would open a chain of restaurants that sell, if you're in Thai, Thailand, Thai cuisine, if you are in uh, Japan, Japanese cuisine, etc. And then, guys, the fourth point is culture and entrepreneurial orientation. Okay. Culture influences entrepreneurial orientation. So, cultures that are more entrepreneurial tend to do better at business. Um, if you go to some countries, there are literally businesses everywhere and the majority of people are employed within the informal sector. Uh, we often criticize people from other countries who come to South Africa and who open spas, shops, etc. because they are supposedly stealing our jobs and the like. The reality is that they come from entrepreneurial cultures. So they come to our country with the idea that I'm going to start something and I'm going to make it work. A good example of this is the Portuguese community who came to South Africa or they started coming to South Africa in the 70s and early 80s. Um, they opened the proverbial corner cafes all over the place, uh, but they fulfilled a need within the community. And these guys, through their businesses, also grew other businesses within society, i.e. the farmers who provided them with their goods, uh, the factories uh, that they bought goods from, etc., etc. So your entrepreneurial Orientation within a culture is also important for building business within a particular culture. So now, guys, uh, the last thing. There are five questions for your portfolio. Uh, the five questions are important, guys. Same rules apply. As with the other chapters, these are the questions that I can ask you in the final exam. It is important that uh, you answer the questions You answer the questions yourself, guys. Sit down, work out the questions. It's all fine and well. You go to feedback. However, the feedback is going to be limited because you, you have all the information here. I've provided you with a set of notes that literally creates or contains all the inf relevant information relating to these questions. Uh, okay. So I'm not going to give detailed feedback on the questions. You need to sit down and work out the questions for yourself. Thank you.